Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to a spe special event tonight, sponsored by the Society for Armenian Studies and co-sponsored by the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. This is a book launch for an important intellectual historian uh, thinker, uh, one of the most important ones actually in the diaspora. Uh, it's a launch of, uh, of his book, uh, The Politics of Naming the Armenian Genocide, Language, History, and the Medzierer. Uh, before starting uh, the, uh, the presentation and the uh, presenting the speakers, I'd like to talk about the series in which this book has appeared. It was the inaugural book in the series called The Armenians, Armenians in the Modern and the Early Modern World uh, by Ibi Torres, uh, which began about a year ago. Uh, I'm the series editor of this, uh, of, the, of this series, and it's a collective effort to start bringing new voices and new, uh, new ways of thinking about history. The series Armenians in the Modern and Early Modern World responds to the growth by promoting innovative and interdisciplinary approaches to Armenian history, politics, and culture in the period between the 16th and the 21st century. Focusing on the geographies of the Mediterranean, Middle East, and contemporary Russia, it directs specific attention to imperial and post-imperial frameworks, from the Ottoman Empire to modern Turkey, Arab Middle East, the Safavid Qajar empires to Iran, and the Russian Empire to Soviet Union and post-Soviet countries. Reflecting the interdisciplinary nature of the field, the series welcomes proposals from scholars in Ottoman Turkish studies, Iranian studies, Slavic studies, Middle Eastern studies, Mediterranean studies, and disciplines of history, political science, anthropology, uh, literature, and sociology, among others. Topics and themes include, but are not limited to the following areas, trade and economy, cultural production, political history, gender, intra and inter-religious relations, diaspora, genocide, nationalism, and identity formation, and democratization. The series publishes monographs and edited collections. All proposals and manuscripts are subject to a rigorous peer review. My name is Bedros Dermatosian. I forgot uh, to mention my name. I'm the president of the Society for Armenian Studies, associate professor of history at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. The series has excellent advisory board from different parts of the world. Levon Abrahamian, Silva Aljaji, Sebo Aslanian, Stepan Asturian, Rachel Goshkarian, Ron Sini, uh, Christina Maranci, Tsolin Nalbantian, Anna Ohanian, among others. So this is the first book, the inaugural book in the series. As you can see, this is the cover of the book, uh, The Politics of Naming the Armenian Gen Genocide, Language, History, and Medzirern. And I'd like also to, 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 to uh, read some of the reviews, the blurbs of the book. This is by Khachik, Professor Khachik Tololian, the preeminent scholar of uh, Armenian diaspora and diaspora studies, one of the founders of diaspora studies and the founder of Armenian diaspora studies from uh, currently emeritus professor of letters. He says, Matyosian offers an analytical narrative of changing uses of Medzirer one of several terms used by Armenians to denote the genocide they suffered a generation before Lemkin invented that English term. Immersed in historical record, as well as the contemporary archives of Armenian genocide memorialization, Turkish denial and American collaboration with that effort, Matyosian offers a matchless analysis of texts ranging from newspaper articles and books to 114 monuments and shows how diplomats seeking to evade the moral and legal consequences of fully acknowledging the genocide, sought to use the Armenian term for shameful camouflage. His compelling analysis is a unique contribution and its two lengthy appendices offer a matchless record for future investigations of the links between language and politics. The second review is by famous literary critic of the 20th century and philosopher Mark Nishanian, the author, among many other books, The Historiographic Perversion. He says, Varta Matyosan's book is an erudite overview of the uses of the Armenian word Yeren across the ages and an in-depth study of the systematic misuses of his same word in translation within the languages of civilized world, especially in the last few decades, allegedly for the sake of reconciliation or for more obscure political reasons. The politics of naming the Armenian genocide offers 
its readers a superb demonstration of the fact that at least in the cases where genocidal will is at work, an event can acquire a historical existence only through its meaning, meaningful reception. This is yet another confirmation of the Hegelian law according to which there can be reality only there where some sense is involved, albeit, albeit retrospectively. So uh, there is 30 percent, uh, 30 percent, uh, uh, 30 percent discount on the book for this specific event. I'm going to type this too in the in the chat section. I also want to announce the second book in the series coming up next year. Coming out next year, it's a book by David Lowy called "The Picturing the Ottoman Armenian World: Photography in Erzurum." Kharfib Kharpert Von and Beyond by David Lowe. There are other books in the pipeline. I cannot disclose information because they're under review currently. So uh, I'd like to represent or present, actually not represent, present our uh, distinguished speaker today. Uh, let me just make him a host. Our speaker today is Vartan, Dr. Vartan Makhiosyan, who is the author of the book, The Politics of Naming the Armenian Genocide, Language, History, and the Medzirer. The book explores the genealogy of the concept of Medzirer, the great crime, the Armenian term for the mass murder and ethnic cleansing of the Armenian ethno-religious group in the Ottoman Empire between the years 1915 to 1923. Widely accepted by historians as one of the classical cases of genocide in 20th, 20th, 20th century, ascribing the right definition to the crime has been a source of contention and controversy in international politics. Bartja Matiosian here draws upon extensive research based on Armenian sources neglected in much of the current historiography as well as other European languages in order to trace the development of the concepts pertaining to mass killing and genocide of Armenians from the ancient to the modern periods. Beginning with an analysis of the term itself, he shows how the politics of its use involved as Armenians struggled for international recognition of the crime after 1945 in the face of Turkish protest. Taking a combined historical, philological, literally, and political perspective, the book is an insightful exploration of the politics of naming a catastrophic historical event and the competitive nature, nature of a national collective memory. So, Vartan Matiosian. Vartan is, Dr. Matiosian is a historian and a literary scholar and critique. He is currently the executive director of the Eastern Prelacy of the Armenian Apostolic Church since 2019. He was born in Uruguay and studied and lived in Argentina until moving to the United States in 2000. He earned his PhD from the Institute of History National Academy of Sciences of the Republic of Armenia. He has published scores of articles, translations, book reviews, and essays, mostly in Armenian, Spanish, and English. After five books in Armenian and one in Spanish, this is his second book in English. He has co-authored with Artsvi Bakhchinyan, an Armenian woman of the world, life and work of Armen Ohanian, the dancer of Shamacha, forthcoming with the Armenian Studies series at Fresno State University with the general editor, Professor Barlo Dermagodician. He has edited, Dr. Matiosian has edited 25 books in Armenian, English, and Spanish, and an Armenian edition of Gostan Zaryan's The Island and the Man, and Lawrence Durrell's Prospero's Cell is forthcoming in Montreal. He has translated 22 volumes into Spanish, English, and Armenian, with a Spanish translation of Aurora Martigian's memoirs, scheduled to be published next month in Buenos Aires. Welcome, Dr. Matiosian, and welcome everyone to this event. The floor is yours, Dr. Matiosian. We can't hear you. One second. Uh... Thank you, Bedros, for that uh, presentation. 
And thank you to SAS and Nasser for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, and thank you above all to the, uh, to the series and to you, Bedros, for incorporating this book as the first book in the series Armenians in the modern and early modern world. Um, I have to say before starting that probably those who know me uh, would, wouldn't consider me a genocide scholar. And uh, genocide has not been my preferred subject of interest during my scholarly career, despite the fact that I have uh, dealt with tangentially with genocide issues and especially with writers who are victims or survivors of the genocide. But uh, usually uh, in my scholarship, there are two things that I, can, that I vouch for. One of them is the uh, prevalence of facts about above opinions. And the second one is the prevalence of context about anything else. And when the issue under consideration came across me uh, during the past two decades, and it became obvious that there was an absence of facts and an absence of context, I thought that uh, being someone who has uh, some knowledge of the Armenian language, the Armenian history, and the Armenian literature, uh, I was positioned to say a few things because apparently there was nobody else who wanted to say a few things. So this is how this book started, and this is how it books took shape, the book took shape over the past 10 years. Uh, now about uh, the book. Uh, the introduction you see on the screen, the introduction on the first part of the book, uh, after the introduction with, uh, of course, uh, gives a general idea of where we, I am going with this book. The first part is about uh, the relationship of language and history, and particularly how Iran was used in the past until the, uh, the late 19th century, then uh, immediately before and after 1915, and uh, after uh, 1915, or after 1922, let's say, with the creation of the diaspora, uh, how the, word, the name Medjerian and parallel, in a parallel sense, the word genocide uh, was used uh, both in Armenia and the diaspora uh, since 1922 until uh, this day. Uh, now about a little bit about the genealogy of the word Yerian. And here we are going to a little bit into linguistics. Vartan, I will try to be, yes. Sorry, can you click on uh, current slides so everyone can see the slides there? Go up, go up, file, under file, go under file. Yes. And click from the beginning. No. Oh, go okay. Back. Here? Yeah, click on that. Yes, now you can. It's bigger now, that's why. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. It's okay. Yeah. So um, now, very, very, uh, uh, very briefly about uh, the origin of the word Yerem. The root of the word Yerem is the common Indo-European language. This is, we are talking about uh, for, uh, the fourth millennium and the third millennium uh, before Christ. Uh, where when the Armenian language still didn't exist as such. So there was a root in the Proto-Indo-European language, the root L, which meant to destroy, to spoil. From that root came up in Proto-Armenian, meaning the, uh, the version of Armenia, which was spoken before classical Armenian, the fifth century Armenian ever existed. So it's a theoretical reconstruction. Uh, that re theoretical reconstruction says that uh, that root L from the Indo-European came into Armenia as the root Yer, L first, and then became, would become Yer as we know it in the, in the fifth century, and an Armenian suffix Er. And then there was a second evolution we took, uh, which combined the root L again, the suffix Er, now uh, er with Ra, for those who know Armenian, and another suffix, which, is, which was uh, first the suffix no or na, 
which then gave uh, the, the, the suff second suffix nu, which we have today. So today we have, in classical Aramean, we find the root yer and two suffixes, yer and nu. nu. So they compose the word, the, uh, the word yerem with the meanings of evil and crime in the, in the fifth century literature, fifth century AD literature, uh, especially the Armenian translation of the Bible, uh, the works of Yesni Gokhpatsi, and the other translations uh, uh, done in the fifth century. So this is about the word Yerer. But there is a second word, which is the word Yerer Yerar, which also existed in classical Armenian. And this also had an Proto Indo European root, again, L or also all, which was the onomatopoeic root for the sound of lamentation, from which we have words like these uh, Greek words, elegeian, ololizein, which gave the more known English words, elegy and ululation, for instance, among other words which are less known, of course, and not in English, at least. So that root, Proto-Indo-European root, gave us the proto armenian root, yelar, which ended in the fifth century, attested as Yerar. Then it evolved to another term, Yerer, which is not attested as such, meaning lament or, or mourning. And this uh, term Yerer with Re, with Re, not with Ra, so with a much, with a, uh, a much um, uh, soft sound than the r, ra. This, uh, this word here is the one we find commonly in, uh, in these days in, in uh, modern Armenia with the word yereragan, meaning la uh, uh, lamentable, tragic. So we have here two different words where almost with the same sound. One is yerern and the other is yerer. And I want to have this, uh, this in mind when we go move forward in our, uh, in our explanation. So what do we have here? That before and after 1915, after the meanings evil and crime in classical Armenian, in modern Armenian, the word uh, uh, takes the meaning crime and heinous crime with the exact word in French, forfait, which is not, uh, which we don't have an exact uh, equivalent in English, which, and the most, uh, the closer word is heinous crime. Uh, and then sometime if between 1915 and 1965, it's, it's, very, it's very hard to pinpoint an exact date. Uh, another meaning was added, massacre. In 1965, we find that Mezieren already translated both as simultaneously as great massacre or great massacres and genocide of the Armenians. And in 1978, this is when the translation genocide starts to get traction. Now, uh, we have another, an issue which happens in the 19th century, which is that the word Yeren and the word Yerer, both of them, are conflated in the nor Haigazian Lezvi Pararan, the New Armenian Language Dictionary, which was published by the Mechitized Fathers of Venice in 1836 and 1837, and it is the most important source of, uh, or the mother source for classical Armenian until this day. So this conflation, where both words uh, supposedly had so the, they had the same meaning, meaning that the word Yerem would have mean both evil crime and lament mourning, remained the secondary meaning of the word Yerem. And after 1915, Yerem was marginally used with the meaning tragedy or calamity. I repeat, marginally used, not mainly used. And it's important to understand the rest, the, the rest of the conversation too. Now, I would like you to point your attention to these seven keywords that you see on the screen, which are Yerem first, meaning crime, 
then the adjective Yeher uh, meaning criminal, then the noun Yeher court meaning criminal as a noun, as the perpetrator of the crime, then the another noun Yeher Nakorzutyun, which means crime, criminal act, commission of a crime, and then several other compound words, Yeher Pan, meaning criminologist, Yeherna Port, meaning a criminal attempt, and most uh, interestingly, Yeherna Tadadian, which means criminal court. So if you, if you th thought for one second that it, uh, it is possible to replace these words, any of the roots in these words, by the secondary on the marginal meaning calamity, you should, you should need to explain how a calamity court or a tragedy court ever exists in a legal system of any country, for instance. So here we find out that, and we, we need to keep, um, keep uh, eyes on this, that victimizer and victim are connected by relation of cause and effect, which is pretty much uh, obvious, where the victimizer performs, performs the action, for instance, deportation, through active verbs, execute or perpetrate, for instance, a victimizer perpetrates the deportation or executes the deportation to effect agency, for instance, genocide, on the victim. And the use of passive verbs, for instance, to happen, to be fell, reflects the victim's mental perception. For instance, in the words tragedy, calamity of catastrophe, when we say in, in plain English, the tragedy that befell the Armenian people we don't say the tragedy that was perpetrated against the Armenian people. So this uh, reflection of the victim's mental perception uh, through tragedy, calamity, or catastrophe lacks any agency because it is not an action per se. Of course, anyone should understand at this point that uh, the Armenian genocide, for instance, is both a genocide and a catastrophe. There is nothing... Uh, against that, it is both things. It is only the perception or the, the angle where we, we uh, observe the event, where we distinguish between the action and the reaction, the cause and the effect, the crime and the tragedy. And this distinction is a fundamental thing to understand that the event per se, it's a crime. Without the crime, there wouldn't be a tragedy. I, want, I would like to go back and uh, uh, a beautiful example that I found on a TV program a few months ago. So uh, in Law and Order Organized Crime, I came across this episode where a black young man coming out from a store is, uh, meets two policemen and one of them crushes his hand, where, where tackles him and crushes his hand when he tries to uh, get to his cell phone, which has fallen on the, on the, on the floor. And in the next episode, the main, the main uh, protagonist of the series, the detective, meets uh, the mother of this black young man, who of course has, has lost all use of the, of the hand that he wanted to use to play guitar. And the detective says, I'm sorry for what happened to your son. The answer of the mother is, it didn't happen to him. It was done to him. So, Again, we see it here the, the clear difference with, between action and effect. So uh, if it had just happened, it would have been a kind of an accident that you know, he lost his hand. It was the, the, man, the man came across his hand and he just happened to, uh, to step on it. But it, it's not that it happened to step on it. It happened that it was purposefully done. So there is the difference between, again, action and reaction, or cause and effect. Now, the second part, we have, uh, I have developed here the, re the relationship between politics and language, uh, taking uh, the cases of uh, John Paul II and use of the word uh, of the expression medieval in Armenia in 2001. Then uh, in Turkey, the use of uh, the, the phrase, the denial of the great catastrophe, in the uh, apology campaign of 2008-2009, and of course, uh, the context for that before and after going since uh, the early 1980s, the use of Yerel in the 1980s until uh, 2020. Then in the United States from uh, 
from uh, Reagan's genocide of the Armenians to uh, Obama's Medievern. And then another chapter where I'm, uh, I bring into comparison uh, the cases in Uruguay and the United States and about uh, the kind of words that were used for recognition or non-recognition in that case. And then a conclusion. So the secondary meaning calamity or catastrophe was picked up in the 2000s as a tool for interpretive denial. And the translations great calamity and great catastrophe were uncritically accepted by Armenians leading to self-denial. By the way, no bilingual dictionary, no bilingual dictionary had calamity or catastrophe as primary or secondary meaning of Yerem between 1915 and 2009. 11 bilingual dictionaries translated Yerem as genocide between 1995 and 2014. Now, uh, what I want to say is not that Yerem per se necessarily should be translated everywhere as genocide, because as I said, there are several meanings which have uh, been overlapping over the past 100 years, crime, massacre, genocide. But I just want to point out to the fact that when we are talking about uh, or accepting um, or criticizing the use of the word medieval, we first would need to think deeply about what it means and then make our criticism or not making our criticism. Uh, I have added also two appendices, one uh, about the meaning of Yerem in the scholarship in, by translators and scholars and the different and many times contradictory translations that I have come across. And then uh, another appendix where I have listed as uh, Hachi Teolian mentioned in his, in his review, uh, 114 memorial inscriptions where the word Yerel and or genocide have been used since 1965 until uh, 2019. Now, I want to point out a few things before going into the end. Let's remember that the legal word genocide and the adjective Armenian were combined first into the phrase Turkish genocide of the Armenians back in the 19, uh, starting in 1940s, 50s, and especially in 1960s, which then was simplified a little bit as genocide of the Armenians, then a little, a little bit as genocide of Armenians, and then it became Armenian genocide, which is the most used form to this day. Armenian genocide at its turn was capitalized into Armenian genocide with capitals under the assumption that it bolsters the prospect of recognition. Now, on the other hand, let's also remember the proper name of the Jewish genocide is Shoah, which literally means catastrophe or Holocaust, as it has been translated by the Israelis themselves in 19, since 1948. The proper name of the Ukrainian genocide is Holodomor, Great Famine. The proper name of the Armenian genocide is Medierer, Great Heinous Crime or Great Genocide according to the context where it is used. Now, remember another thing. Seras Panutyun is an Armenian word for genocide. Yeren, as I have tried to show, is synonym to Seras Panutyun. Ergo, Yeren is an Armenian word for genocide. So both words can be used and have been used, are, are used until this day, interchangeably. Now, I want to point a few uh, uh, cases only, only a, few, a, few, a little sample of uh, cases going in uh, backwards in chronological order where we see, for instance, the use of Moshagota in Yerem, cultural genocide, on the website of the Foreign Ministry of the Armenian Republic in 2018. Here you see uh, at the top in uh, the Armenian text and uh, on the bottom the English, the same English text, uh, the English translation. Then this is a, a map that I came across. I came across this ad a few days ago. This is a map of the Armenian genocide uh, published in 2015 on the 100th anniversary where you see Hayot Medierna on the, on the left and the right Armenian genocide. So the author of the map surely knows that uh, there is a word called uh, a word genocide, uh, to call the genocide and 
Uh, there, uh, no doubt that he knows that word or she knows that word, but he has chosen to use the word Teraspanut uh, Yeren as a, uh, as a synonym to genocide. And, you, and as you see here, Medjerer handed Armenian genocide and ge uh, uh, genocide Armenian in Russia. So we see here the use of the three expressions as synonyms. Now, the, co the cover of the book. This is the picture of the April 24, 1990 uh, procession to Dzernaga Perth, to the mo uh, monument to the uh, Armenian genocide in Yerevan. As you see here, there is a very curious, um, I would say, a, a micro example or micro memorial of Dzernaga Perth being uh, taken towards the monument as an offering. I mean, uh, a very special flower uh, composition, where we see uh, the four uh, the four cases: 1896, the Hamidia massacre; 1909, the other massacres; 1988, the Sungait massacres; and 1990, the Baku massacre. And here, of course, 1915, across the the four days. On the right, we see genocide and Yerem. 75. And of course, I can make the comment that whoever wrote these words had an idea that, you know, there was a word Teraspanutun, or even there was another word, the long word genocide, which is a long word for Russian, which was in use in the 80s and 90s in Armenia. And he could have put, uh, put here uh, genocide or Teraspanutun, but he or she didn't do that, but use Yerel and genocide on the uh, side by side. This is the, the first monument where the word Yeren was used in the United States in trans, with a translation, which is in Niagara Falls in the state of New York in 1980. We find here a description of the monument which says, Kachkari Hishadak Hadar Dasningi Dasning Yerni Hai Nahadaga, which has its translation in English in memoriam Armia Martis of the 1915 genocide. As you see here, 1915 year, 1915 genocide. This is the uh, the monument erected on Sormont Elian's grave in the Arad Cemetery in Fresno, uh, which was uh, inaugurated in 1969. Here you have the inscription in Armenian and in English. By the way, of course, the English uh, inscription was renovated years ago, botched the name of the of the hero because it should have been Sormont Elian with an I and they replace it with that E, God knows why. But uh, here we have, uh, I, I have translated the, this paragraph where they use the term Tehaspan for Talat Pasha, genocidaire, and uh, they use April Yeren, Abilian Yeren, in the Armenian inscription, where in the English inscription, as we see, they use uh, Turkish perpetrator of the Armenian genocide of 1915. Finally, going back to 1965, you have here two Cinderella stamps, the stamps that don't have a commercial value. Here we have uh, this one at the top, which was published in the United States, which mentions, mentions the 50th anniversary of the Armenian Iran in Armenia and the 50th anniversary of the Turkish genocide of the Armenians in England. And down here, this one, which was done, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, in France, no, excuse me, uh, in Lebanon, which uh, mentions Hisuna Miyagi 50th anniversary of the Yerren, and the 50th commemoration of the Armenian genocide in English. And finally, there was a series of booklets published in 1965 by the commemorative committee of the 50th anniversary of the Turkish genocide of the Armenians, which in the first booklet it was called Commemorative Committee of the fifth, on the 50th anniversary of the Armenian massacres. And then after the third book, they started change, they changed the name and the offices were in 20, 220, uh, 212 Seward Street, which everybody knows in Boston, I believe where it was that office, now it's 80 by Jello Avenue. So the, the one book that was booklet that was published in Armenian, it said that Haragutuni Egerni Hisuna Miyagi Getronan Hans Pahumpi. 
publication of the committee for the 50th anniversary of the Yerren. So we see here Yerren in Armenian, again, at, uh, starting with the third uh, booklet, Turkish Genocide of the Armenian. And here I will stop and uh, I will thank everybody for their patience. And I hope this has been more or less explanatory of what I intended to do of the book. But of course, this is just a, a gist of what it is, the entire contents of the book. But there is a lot more to talk about. And probably there will be questions about this and from the panel too. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you very much, Vartan. Uh, our first speaker on the panel is uh, Dr. Talar Shahinian who holds a PhD in comparative literature from the University of California, Los Angeles and lectures in the program for Armenian studies at UC Irvine, where she's also a visiting faculty in the Department of Comparative Literature. Her research interests include world literature, transnationalism, politics of Western Armenian literary history and language, and questions in trauma, aesthetics and representation. Her forthcoming book, Stateless, The Politics of the Armenian Language in Exile, will be published by Syracuse University Press, which focuses on two key moments in Western Armenian literary history, post-World War I Paris and post-World War II Beirut, to examine how stateless language sustains itself in a diasporic setting. She has served as assistant editor of the Armenian Review between the years 2010 and 2017, and is currently co-editor of the prominent journal Diaspora, a journal of transnational studies. As you remember, uh, Professor Tololian was the founder and the, uh, and, and the uh, editor of this journal. She contributes regularly to the online journal Critics Forum and literally magazine Pakin. Thank you, Dr. Shahinian, for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Vedig. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here. It's a great pleasure. Um, and I'm so happy to see so many familiar um, faces out there. Um, Varsan, I want to start by congratulating you on this publication. Um, I think it makes a colossal contribution to our understanding of our language practices in relation to the concept of genocide. For me, um, what, what is most impressive about the book is your ability to so seamlessly intertwine on one hand, the book's encyclopedic scope um, in its attempt to sort of offer bird's eye views um, through the sur surveys of the word uh, Yerer and its usage. Um, and on the other hand, it's analytical discussions that dive deep and closely read the word's usage within contexts that range from literature to political documents. Through these two parallel movements that zoom out and zoom in, the book offers an unprecedented overview of the intersections of traumatic memory, language, and the politics of recognition in the context of the Armenian genocide. Of course, in the Armenian context, due to Turkey's denial, the political power that the word genocide carries leaves very little room for nuanced discussions of the event, not so much as a historical occurrence, but rather as an experience of catastrophe. Mark Nishanyan's many articles and volumes that have tried to philosophically conceptualize the experience of genocide as an interdiction of mourning or as a failure of witnessing are often met with discomfort for fear of taking away from the debates of genocide within a justice framework, be it punitive or restorative. I think where this book's main contribution lies is in its attempt to bridge the gap between these two approaches by examining the history of a single unit, the word Yeren, as it travels through the Armenian world over the last few centuries. In tracing the evolution of Yered's meaning um, and the tension between lament and crime, the book asks its readers to confront the underlying question within the politics of naming a genocide, which is whose experience does a name name? Is it the perpetrator's actions or is it the victim's experience? Is the name to represent a criminal act or a catastrophic event? 
ultimately, what we're talking about, of course, is a question of representation. I found it interesting that the epigraph of your book, uh, Vartan, of uh, the, the introductory chapter, uh, rather, is a quote by Tatu Sonens Papazian, which uses Yeren, but also highlights the limits of language um, in, in being able to describe or in being able to represent the horrors of what uh, Papazian calls these outrageous crimes against humanity. This idea of irrepresentability that launches the book's discussion of the politics around naming the Armenian genocide echoes what Naomi Mandel has termed the unspeakable in the context of the Jewish Holocaust. It refers to how trauma studies, the multidisciplinary subfield that burgeoned in the 1990s and continues to evolve, attempts to theorize trauma's representation in language and more broadly, its impact on literature. Taking as their departure point Freud's understanding that traumatic experiences cause dissociation, dissociation in the psyche, first wave scholars like Kathy Carruth examined psychoanalytical theories of catastrophe and Holocaust testimonies to argue that trauma's inability to be assimilated within consciousness in the time of its original occurrence produces pathological effects in the survivor, making the experience painful through the act of remembering and therefore traumatic only belatedly through delayed reactions. In other words, for scholars like Caruth, Trauma describes the presence of an occurrence that is experienced repeatedly and belatedly through absence. As a result, she argues that any attempt to represent the traumatic experience in language, a system of meaning making, will leave the survivor in an impasse. Of course, not all discourse within trauma studies takes the inherent unspeakability of trauma as its focal point. More recently, scholars like Mandel, who, whom I mentioned, have argued for a more versatile and pluralistic understanding of trauma. Also within philosoph philosophical discourse, the irrepresentability of trauma as tied to the impossibility of mourning has also been critiqued. Gillian Rose, for instance, by arguing that the very idea of democracy uh, relies on representation, linked the claim that genocidal violence is beyond reason or beyond comprehension to fascist thought. She argued that by prohibiting the study of tyranny's connection to justice through the framework of reason, we also eliminate the need for restorative political action. I make these tangential and comparative remarks to highlight how varying definitions of trauma intersect with theories of representation this book, uh, Vartan Matosyan's book, The Politics of Naming the Armenian Genocide, not only adds to the corpus of such theoretical explorations, but it also bridges the necessary gaps in the Armenian collective imaginary when it comes to conceptualizing the genocide. As such, it will be an invaluable resource to students and scholars of genocide studies um, and Armenian studies I'm looking forward to uh, the broader uh, discussion of it today and having the book in my hand, hopefully soon, Martin. Thank you very much, Dr. Shahinian. I'm going to go the last, I have few comments or a few, I'm not going to take time and just going to uh, give the floor to uh, Mark Marigonian, just present. Migonian is the Director of Academic Affairs at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser, where he has worked since 1998, plays a dominant role within the organization, who is very humble in his uh, biography, I should say. He's the editor of the book, The Armenians of the New England, and the co-author of annotated editions of James Joyce novels, a portrait of the Arthris as a young man and Ulysses. His work has appeared in the Journal of Armenian Studies, Journal of the Society for Armenian Studies, Genocide Studies International, the Armenian Review, the James Joyce Quarterly, as well as other um, outlets. Uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Uh, take your time. Thank you. Thanks, Petros. Thank you, Thank you very much. Presentation now. Beg your pardon. 
I sacrifice my presentation for your presentation. I see. I, I will make use of the time then. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I want to congratulate Vartan on the publication of this book, which is such a welcome and valuable contribution and which draws on such a wealth of sources. In this respect, the book is a reflection of its author, uh, who not only for me, but also for many others, is an invaluable and generous source of insights, suggestions, sources, and collegial wisdom. So uh, there couldn't be a more fitting book to, to encapsulate uh, who, who Vartan is to, to his friends and colleagues. The Politics of Naming the Armenian Genocide is an important work of scholarship and, as, as Talar has said, is equally of value for linguists, historians, genocide scholars, and students of contemporary political discourse around the Armenian Genocide, uh, perhaps among other areas. Through its minute focus on one word in particular, Yeren, it opens up whole worlds of knowledge. I personally first became aware of Meds Yeren as an issue, as opposed to as a term, in the early 2000s. I knew it was a name, although not necessarily the name, used in Armenian for what I, an English-speaking Armenian-American, knew as the Armenian Genocide, or what, when I was growing up, because news travels slowly to New Hampshire, I knew of simply as the massacres, of which one of my grandmothers was a survivor. I certainly wasn't aware, and I doubt that too many others will be either, of the fascinating history of usage in Armenian that Vartan unpacks in the first chapters of this book. Unquestionably, by the time of President George W. Bush, who referred to the great calamity in his April 24 statements as a way of dodging the word genocide, while also ostensibly, if inaccurately, invoking the Armenian Mezyahern, a pattern was set in place. Vartan provides a very detailed and cogent account of this period, which is where I'm going to focus my attention. Where the rubber hit the road, so to speak, as far as I was concerned, was in late 2008, just after the election of Barack Obama, but before his inauguration. When fears of what Obama would say on April 24th, 2009 ran high, and a small group of Turkish writers and scholars launched the I Apologize campaign which Vartan discusses in the book. This is not the time or place to revisit that in detail, but what is relevant is not only that the so-called apology referenced in Armenian, Mezhiyaren, rendered in English as the Great Calamity and in Turkish as Buyuk Felaket, but also that the authors of the statement, and one author in particular, namely Baskin Oran, both doubled down on the mistranslation and chastised Armenians on the following grounds. Quote, great catastrophe in Armenian, Mezhiyaren, was the only definition, the only expression used until the Armenian diaspora discovered the PR value of Armenian genocide, unquote. This remarkable phase in the discourse, where it seemed a mad scramble was on to influence or preempt what Obama would or would not say and how he would say it, to find some alternative to the dreaded G word, preferably one that displaced agency or responsibility, reminds me of an anecdote about W.C. Fields, the actor. Uh, if, if you're under a certain age, you'll have to look him up. Uh, according to one of the innumerable versions of this anecdote, in the 1940s, shortly before his death, the less than religious Fields was caught in the unlikely situation of thumbing through a Bible. When an explanation was requested, he simply replied that he was, quote, looking for loopholes. In this case, great catastrophe slash calamity provided that loophole for some. I found it at the time particularly stunning that members of the descendants of the perpetrator group, whether actual or self-proclaimed liberals or not, had the temerity to insist on what was or was not proper usage among the descendants of the victim group. In short, Medziagarn versus Armenian genocide became yet another way of sorting the good Armenians from the bad Armenians the authentic and admirable Armenians from the wicked and politicized Armenians, a process in which, unfortunately, a few Armenians participated and more than a few stood mutely by. The authors of the apology were not genocide deniers in the usual literal sense of the word, but they helped provide cover for deniers, and they both drew on denialist arguments, 
such as the notion that the Armenian diaspora only started using genocide due to its PR value or as a way of copying Jews and helped le further legitimize these uh, arguments. Denial is a mercurial thing, changeable, unable to be pinned down, and like mercury, poisonous. Perhaps the meds yegern equals great catastrophe caper is best described in terms used by author Kevin Young in his book, Bunk, The Rise of Hoaxes, Humbug, Plagiarists, Phonies, Postfacts, and Fake News. Young refers to, quote, the half hoax, the modern condition in which bunk is believed, mistranslation reigns, and truth be not so much damned as not bothered with, unquote. Vartan's work, therefore, is absolutely necessary and a necessary form of correction. The real issue, as Vartan makes abundantly clear, is the improper insistence on mesiagern instead of genocide or vice versa, rather than understanding that they both refer to the same great heinous crime, uh, that is the extermination of the Armenian people. As he writes, words do not change the past, but needless to say, the ultimate goal of their corruption is to rewrite the facts, unquote. Vartan's book, with its strong grounding in the facts and in a multitude of well-documented sources goes a long way towards correcting the record. We are all grateful recipients of, of this work. Uh, I learned a lot from it. I think anybody who reads it will learn a lot from it. I can only say well done, and I'm pleased to, uh, pleased to be on, on this panel to say so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, uh, my presentation is a bit long, but I'm just going to co cover a few, few, uh, make few comments here. First of all, about the resources that Barton uses. It's breathtaking. We have, uh, as a historian, I always look at sources. We have above 127 periodicals and newspapers in Armenian, uh, English, uh, Spanish, Italian name it. Uh, then we have yearbooks, uh, more than 100 dictionaries in uh, classical Armenian, uh, Italian, French, uh, German, and, uh, you know, he covered everything. The book is important, I think, not only for Armenian studies, but also genocide studies. Most of genocide scholars do not know the, the intricacies of the concept of Medziaren or the, or the way that Armenians defined the, uh, the genocide. Uh, there is a misunderstanding about the concept that Armenian came, Armenians came, came up with, not came up with, but started defining the, uh, the genocide. Uh, even, even lately, uh, a prominent scholar of Middle Eastern studies uh, claimed the same, the same Started the same argument that Armenians after World War II started uh, started copying the Holocaust and claiming that Armenians started embracing the concept of genocide. Whereas if you think about it, genocide means Sevaspanutun, and the first time that Armenians used the word Sevaspanutun was in 1933, prior even before Raphael Lemkin came up with the concept of genocide. I, I think that societies have different ways to cope with traumatic events such as genocide. Defining such a calamity is extremely difficult task. Think of the word aret, for example, which the prominent Armenian philosopher and literary critique came up. The word has been abused by other scholars, specifically Turkish ones. Aret goes beyond genocide, beyond genocide in order to define what has happened. Even, for example, Hagop Oshagan wanted to write a book about the Armenian genocide, a novel about the Armenian genocide, but he couldn't. He couldn't write it. Can you really write a book about the Armenian genocide, a novel about the Armenian genocide? It's incomprehensible. It's very difficult to do so. It's beyond imagination. Even every single victim is equal to a life itself. Imagine how many people were killed and you make the calculation. They try, they try to come up with words in order to describe the mass murder. This is not only endemic to the Armenian genocide, the Assyrian genocide, for example, they came up with, we know only for Seifo as the sword, but there are other words such as kafle, caravan, which comes from the Arabic kafle and uh, firman 
the order. So this is not only something endemic to the Armenians, but also endemic to all other societies who try to come up with words in order to uh, define the calamity. And that's what Vartan has, did, has done here, is in order, done here to find the genealogy of the words, restructuring the genealogy of the word. And not just Armenians one day came up and said, well, let's use medzirer, let's use medzirer as a word. So it's kind of digging into the concept and it's a major contribution. Because as I said, most of the genocide scholars, Armenian genocide scholars don't know the importance, importance of the value of these concepts. And even Medzirin being kind of a compromise, quote unquote, for being used in English too, in order to avoid the agency, in order to avoid the responsibility has been equated by the Turkish denialist government and scholars as something equivalent to genocide, which is not to a certain extent. If you think about the translation, it's not. The other important point is about agency. Of course, calamity is a concept or catastrophe is a concept that lacks agency if you think about that. There was a major hurricane it led to, it was a major catastrophe. So who's the agents, agency here? Who's the agent here? Where's the agency? God is the agency. So Turkish denial scholars, Turkish state have for decades tried to come up with concepts or copy concepts even in order to deny agency and in order to deny responsibility of the state as an inheritor of a genocidal state. And even as major scholars recently found that there is a strong connection between the Turkish Republic and the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire. I'm not, let me see if I have anything else to add here. Uh, I have a few questions to Vartan and this is the place that we, the panelists start asking one or two questions and then we'll open it to the, the rest. Uh, Vartan, have you, have you done work in examining the Soviet Armenian press and the way in which they depicted what happened. I know Stalinism, censorship until 1965, first question. Second, I'm curious because there is a difference between the literary world where intellectuals wrote about the, about the Medzirin and defined concepts and the popular world. And these popular worlds were different. I don't know what an Armenian survivor from Marash, whose first language was Turkish. My grandparents, for example, or an Armenian from, I don't know, different parts of Cilicia have viewed the event. Is it the calamity? Is it the catastrophe? So these are two questions. And then I'll ask Talar and uh, Mark to ask a few questions. And then everyone, if you have a question, please write it, uh, write it, please write it in the chat section. Um, thank you, uh, Talar, Mark, and Bedros for your uh, insights and your uh, comments about this book. And to uh, address uh, Bedros two questions. Yes, I looked into the Soviet Armenian sources as much as it was possible uh, because, uh, and as much as it was helpful to me uh, within the, the picture of the, um, of the use of Yeren and genocide in the, you know, during the 20th century or after 1915. Uh, I cannot say that it was an exhaustive research of the Soviet uh, press and even the books, because not everything was available to me, um, especially in the case of the press. But uh, anyways, I came up with uh, some interesting uh, notes about it. Uh, for instance, uh, Avediki Sahagian using uh, the word genocidism in 1955, uh, which, which was unheard of before and after, uh, because I haven't seen, I mean, again, my exploration was not exhaustive, so 
uh, but I'm pretty sure that the world uh, either genocide, and I don't think either that Celas Panutium was used before the 1960s, and Isaacian's use is a uh, is a sort of uh, you know a special a special case there. Uh, so Yeren was used uh, at the time. Godorats was used too, but of course. Uh, the whole issue of the genocide as, uh, as such during the Stalin period, except for the immediate post-World War II period, was out of, out of limits. So uh, it was on an on and off situation until the late 1950s. Anyways, afterwards, I, I also uh, found interesting things about that in the books in books, in newspapers, etc. I, I can only make one little comment. 1984, uh, a, a, science, uh, a science fiction book, an American science fiction book, where the word genocide is used three times in a, in a, in a short story. And the three times the word is translated as the end. I'm talking about 1984. And uh, you have the way to, to check because you, you have the English source and you have the Armenian translation. And it was, it was really interesting because the word uh, genocide, uh, and genocide, because as, you, as I said before, from the 1960s, the Russian law world until the late 1980s at least, or early 1990s existed in writing too. It was used in writing. Still, you can use it, you can hear it you know, uh, on the street, let's say. Uh, but the fact that the, uh, the, uh, the translator used the realm, it, it took me aback in a sense. Uh, so it, it, give, it gave an idea, a, a very uh, uh, straightforward idea that really I wasn't wrong in my appreciation that Yerel meant genocide even before or the moment that I consider the, the turning moment, which is the Garapa movement for me. Uh, the Garapa movement for me is the moment where the Yeren genocide equation becomes more and more strong, especially in Armenia, and uh, also, uh, in a sense, in the diaspora, where in the 60s and 70s already you had that uh, equivalence of Teras Panotun and uh, Yeren. I mean, the interchangeable use of both words. You say, uh, you say at the same time. I mean, I have given plenty of examples in the book, so I'm not going to repeat myself here. Okay. Uh, going going let's, to let's your pass to Talar. Let's pass to Talar in order to open it for discussion. Talar, one question maybe, or one, two questions. Actually, mine was related to your second question about the popular, uh, popular usage or, or popular terms. Uh, things that would be in circulation um, in conversations. Uh, but I, I kind of also want to um, uh, guide our attention to announcements of uh, that would pop up in newspapers around uh, April, the month of April. Um, uh, I'm talking pre-1965. Um, and I know I think you touch on this at, at some point, if you could talk a little bit more uh, or say a few words about the calendrical kind of naming uh, with the uh, um, 1124 uh, that I see a lot in, uh, in, in advertisements of uh, commemorative events and that kind of, is there in the politics of naming, would you say there is a difference between that kind of symbolic picking part of the whole to represent uh, the, the, the event versus the Yeren's um, usage? So uh, going to both uh, Bedros and Talar's second question about the popular use, the two words that are most, that I see most used, and I, I hear them uh, all the time in current conversation are chart and axor. Both of them are uh, partial representations of the event. Chart means massacre, massacre. And uh, whoever has said, uh, there, are, there are a couple of sources that say that, uh, Supposedly, it means genocide. It doesn't. Uh, and Aksor means exile, or um, in a in a in a wide sense, deportation. Also, that the concept deportation. Nobody uses Terahanutun 
in a, in a colloquial in a colloquial conversation. So you can uh, understand Axor uh, basically as Israel, which is the which is the uh, straightforward meaning of the word, but also all sorts of kind of movement in that sense, especially when they are forced movement of population. So both words which are used. Uh, are uh, both uh, both indicate a partial approach to the event. They are they don't have that encompassing approach that has, for instance, uh, I understand uh, uh, crime in this case Iran, uh, where uh, both of them uh, both concepts are subsumed into uh, what Iran uh, means because Iran uh, gives gives the idea of the entire of the entire entirety of the uh, event. Of course, in the case of, uh, for instance, uh, Turkish, uh, Turkish speaking Armenians, I would say without being, without being too much, going too much into that because it's not my, my cup of tea. I mean, the knowledge of uh, Turkish in this sense, but uh, basically they would have used Sürgün, which is, uh, again, the uh, English, the Turkish uh, version of Aksor. And uh, we see the use of Sürgün here and there uh, in, Ar in Armenian sources too. Uh, so uh, I would say that th that would be one of the colloquial words used uh, for uh, genocide. A third word that has been used in some, uh, to a certain extent, uh, colloquially, but not that much as chart is Godorad, which also means massacre. And it has very hard to me to come up with a different meaning. Uh, I mean, what is the, the special meaning of Godorat in relation to chart, where both terms actually come from the same idea of cutting it to pieces. Godor is, is the word Godor, piece, where chart also comes from that concept of cutting. Uh, chartel, uh, the first meaning of chartel, the, the root meaning of chartel is uh, related to cutting. So uh, those are the three words that I would say that colloquially are used uh, in, this, uh, in this sense. Uh, also here, I see my friend Hagop uh, mentioning Sefer Birlik, which is also another word uh, much used by, uh, in, by uh, Turkish uh, uh, speaking Armenians, but not only for, uh, uh, for them, by them, um, but again, those, none of those words, either the Armenian words or the English ones, give that uh, totalizing meaning to the event. They try to give some kind of definition, sometimes even according to the person who's talking about that, who felt it as an exile or felt it as a massacre. And mm -hmm. I believe that that has some sense or some share in, in the way of using one or other word. Okay, Mark, sorry, Barton, I don't want to cut you. I want to open after Mark for- uh, Sure, uh, I, I just questions. finished. Yes, Mark. You can cut him off. He wrote a whole book. <laughs> one question, Mark, only one. One question, one question. One question. One okay, uh, I promised Vartan I would try to, to ask him something something difficult uh, and not just be you know overly complimentary. And I wanted to go back to actually something that, that Talar brought up in her excellent comments as well. Uh, Vartan, you write that foreign proper names and words are no longer exotic. Uh, and of course, you, you uh, adduce the, the cases of, of, the, of Shoah gaining currency for, for Holocaust and Holodomor uh, for the starvation, for starvation in Ukraine. This is of course true as far as it goes. As a counterexample, I would cite uh, the, the Gaelic term uh, androhil, uh, which means the bad times, which is used for the famine or the great hunger, and, and which, while well attested, I doubt has much resonance among the man or woman in the street in, in South Boston, say, uh, or, or in O'Connell Street in, in, in Dublin. Um, and I wonder, too, uh, since I don't know enough about the case of, of Holodomor, uh, whether the the use of that term has indeed limited the the uh, recognition of of that historical event in in the let's say in the English speaking world. Finally, I wonder too, and Bedros is staring at me, so I have to be quick. Whether the whether the assertion that the native term is always somehow inherently more meaningful, which is not your assertion, I realize, 
rather than advocating, as you do, uh, for the use of the foreign term along with the more generic internationally recognized term genocide could have the less than salutary effect of exoticizing the event under discussion by rendering it ineffable, which is not likely to encourage those outside the victim group to make an effort to know about it. And considering the strides that have been made in bringing the discourse on the Armenian genocide into conversation with that around other genocides, I would hate to see anything contribute to isolating the Armenian genocide. Vartan, you have one minute to answer this five minute question. <laughs> Um, in a in a short uh, in a short answer, uh, Mark, I would say that uh, I don't see a reason necessarily to use uh, Medjerem everywhere uh, in Armenian or or in tra uh, of course uh, in transliteration. One could say uh, as they do in English in English, they could say Holocaust if uh, they want. As they say Holocaust, they could say great crime or great genocide whichever is the case, uh, as I said, according to the context of the world, where the word is used. Uh, but uh, on, the other, on the other hand, uh, I think that uh, maybe Holodomor has contributed to, you know, to limiting uh, recognition or else, maybe. I, I, cannot, I cannot vouch for that. Uh, and people more knowledgeable may say, uh, may opine differently. But uh, what I wanted to point out especially was the fact that uh, the word has been used over the past 30 years and they put a, an entire monument in Washington DC to the uh, great famine a few years ago and by Congress law and they used, the Ukrainians used Holodomor in English. They didn't say the great famine. They didn't even say the Ukrainian genocide. They put it Holodomor. What I mean is that the way, in the way that uh, the, the Jew, uh, Jews and Ukrainians uh, take stock of their own language, we should do that. And this is one of the central points of my, of my work, uh, work in general, is that uh, we didn't own the world and we left the world <coughs> to be bastardized and used by people who didn't have the single idea of what they were talking about. And we, we, we allowed it with our own hands. This is what I find reprehensible. And this is what I am I'm trying to point out uh, at the end as one of an uh, explicit or implicit conclusion in the book. Thank you, Vartan. I'm going to stop the recording here now and